everyone. This is Chaitali Bak from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe. Today we have with us Air Vice Marshal Anil Golani, presently working as Additional Director General, Center for Air Power Studies, CAPS, New Delhi. A qualified flying instructor and an instrument rating instructor and examiner commissioned into the fighter stream of the Indian Air Force who has flown who has flown the erstwhile Ajit and Jaguar aircraft. Currently with the one and only strategic think tank of Indian Air Force, he will throw light on the ongoing air war between Russia and Ukraine, which is very, very important right now for all of us. Welcome to ADU's chat room, sir. And now to take the discussion forward, I welcome Sangeeta Saxena, editor, Aviation and Defense Universe. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Jatali. And uh, welcome, sir. Welcome Thank to you. ADU. And uh, this is actually an occasion where, you know, uh, we have really been trying hard to understand that why this air war started so late. Sir. Russia and Ukraine were, you know, uh, at loggerheads and they've been for so long. And then, of course, it got converted into a war. But we were expecting the air war to happen earlier. And now we've realized that it really started late. And we are in the third day of it, sir. So, uh, as an expert, so we'd like to know what could have been the strategic decision behind the war starting late. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sangeeta and Chitali, for getting me on this show. Uh, a few disclaimers at the beginning. I am not any expert, and uh, the views that I give are going to be my own personal and don't uh, reflect that of the Indian Air Force or the government uh, in that matter. Uh, in my opinion or assessment, uh, uh, I felt that the way the Russians uh, started this conflict, uh, they thought that they would be able to wrap it up quickly in a couple of days without the need for their air force going in uh, full bore. And uh, secondly, I also feel that uh, since the Russians treat this region as a part of their own, they did not want too many casualties uh, on the civilian side and all. And therefore, I think this uh, the use of the Air Force in its offensive uh, form was delayed to a certain extent. Now, as the conflict uh, progressed, I think they underestimated the uh, resilience of uh, the people in Ukraine. And uh, that is what has happened. And uh, at this stage, they probably now realize that uh, they cannot succeed or they, you know, unless they get air power in full bore uh, at the early. So that is what uh, my assessment is of the whole thing. Yeah. So, sir, uh, now we'd like to understand from you that, uh, you know, you have, uh, you had surprisingly Ukraine shooting down a lot of, uh, you know, aircraft and choppers of the Russians. Now, we'd like to understand, you know, what is that they have which suddenly is drawn to them that we have something which can really shoot these people down? So, uh, classically, you know, when you fight an air war in any conflict, the uh, firstly, the entire war is taking place over Ukraine and it is not in the Russian territory at all. So, uh, the Ukrainians, when they're using their air defense systems, they are on their home turf, one. Secondly, uh, in my opinion, when if the Russians wanted to use the air power, they should have first gone around neutralizing, that is attacking their air bases and their radars and their man portable, you know, all these uh, surface to air missile systems and all for the air force to be truly effective. Uh, and again, like I said, maybe they underestimated the resilience of the Ukrainians or the ability to shoot down their airplanes. That is why they have suffered losses. Also, some of the aircraft have got uh, damaged or destroyed uh, because of pilot error. Also, we have reports of that as well. And uh, the Russians have not been using uh, flares, chaff or other countermeasures to avoid, uh, you know, uh, the surface to air missile system. They've been flying low level. They've been flying in contested airspace. And they have been flying mostly in support of the army whose aim was to, you know, isolate these big towns and, you know, get them under their control. Right, sir. And uh, so in continuation with it, uh, there are reports and uh, pictures and videos of the Stringer missiles. So uh, 
did we know that Ukraine was so well equipped uh, for this sort of an air combat uh, in such a situation? Uh I, I don't know whether the, see the Russians in my opinion have probably been planning this for a long time so they would have had prior intelligence but uh, I suppose some amount of you know help or support they received from the western nations from Turkey as well also supplied them with some systems you know and all and uh, uh, that is where we are I, I you know uh, any um, fighter aircraft getting uh, knocked off is a big hit on the morale of the people. I, I also uh, have a feeling that the Russian Air Force or the pilots are not so motivated or involved in the war as the Ukrainians are. So there is a big difference here, you know, because they, they feel that they are fighting against their own people. So uh, to an extent, their heart is not... Uh, fully into it as it is of the Ukrainians and I think uh, Zelensky's leadership you may call it foolhardy you may uh, you know uh, in his uh, attempt to take on the might of the Russian Empire but yes the people are with him the Ukrainians are with him where it ends up the situation is you know uh, very dynamic it is changing every uh, hour or every day uh, but I think if you step aside from the Air Force or the war as such, there is a bigger game that is being played, which is what we need to uh, unravel and, you know, think about and talk about and write about. Right, sir. And sir, uh, you know, like with, we've been talking about Ukraine and Russia and uh, because, you know, the aim today was to talk about this air war, you know, the audience has been asking a lot of questions. Which yeah. are the, what are these helicopters like? What are these planes like? Uh, Aren't they the best in the world? The Russians are supposed to have one of the best in the world. So can we talk about these casualty uh, choppers and casualty aircrafts a little bit for our audience to let them know uh, how good they are, how good they could fly. They did a lot of low flying also. And, uh, you know, uh, why? You know, so the audience wants to know why and how about the aircraft. Yeah, so uh, if you look at the capability, the Mi-24 and the Mi-35 uh, class of attack helicopters, the uh, Indian Air Force has also been operating them. But uh, these aircrafts are of, I think, 25 to 30 years, if not more, uh, you know, vintage. And uh, the surface to air missile systems have continued to improve over the years, shoulder fired, stinger, SAMs and all, and everything. And uh, if, if you don't have prior intelligence if i go into an area which has these uh, weapons which can destroy aerial platforms and i don't have enough countermeasures then i am going on a suicidal mission where i know i'm going to face casualties so this is precisely what has happened if you recollect what happened in uh, in our scenario in the cargill conflict on the first day we lost a helicopter uh, to a shoulder fired Sam, we shouldn't have sent in those helicopters in the first place. So it is something akin to that which is happening. And uh, like I said, the, the Russians probably thought that, you know, by sending in the army and by sending in the ground troops, they will be able to break the will of the people or the morale and, you know, uh, Zelensky would uh, uh, capitulate or surrender and uh, uh, all the West would come to some kind of a nego negotiation uh, agreement, you know, with uh, the America, the Brits, the NATO and all, but that has not happened. So, in the absence of this, the conflict has continued to uh, prolong, you know, and 11 today, we are on the 12th day of the war, uh, which is very long for this kind of a conflict. Right, sir. And do you see this air war continuing, sir? Uh, if we want to put an end to this conflict, now we have reached a stage like, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's very easy to get into a conflict, but it is very difficult to pull out unless your objectives are clear from the beginning itself. And uh, uh, Putin's or Russia's objective being to, you know, uh, get uh, uh, the West to stop this eastward expansion of uh, NATO which is not happening and which Zelensky, you know, when in the constitution that he revised in 19, put this, uh, uh, that they will continue to strive toward being a member of the European Union and uh, NATO. So this has irked him no end. And uh, in my opinion, Putin is not going to stop. 
and uh, if he is not going to stop we will see more of air power being utilized and we will see more offensive uh, you know uh, coming from the russians in uh, in the next one or two days that is my uh, take on it all right so and sir there was also a fighter which was shot down so uh, can you tell the audience a little more about this fighter yeah so there there was a fighter there is a lot of stories going around in the twitter and this thing on the ghost of uh, you know king and all of i think these are images which also shows that uh, the uh, you know how warfare has changed and social media and uh, you know cyber and all have become such powerful tools of war that they can actually uh, you know uh, change the tide uh, and public opinion or perception now uh, the fighter uh, probably has got shot down by uh, some surface to air missile or it could have crashed also as an accident for all you know we, i mean it will take some time to unfold but uh, losses do happen and uh, uh, i mean we've had uh, f35s losing you know uh, get crashing and also these fighters are uh, uh, i i will not be able to you know uh, be in a position to confirm or to say that yes this is the cause of the crash or the kill of the uh, fighter but they do happen in, in conflict so okay sir and sir like you were speaking about the information what face sir and uh, who better than you sitting in uh, one of the think tanks and this has been a very major topic of discussion always so uh, where do you think has uh, russia gone wrong in its perception management uh i i don't think russia has gone wrong on in, in perception management in my opinion if you ask me the west has gone, uh, wrong in being able to understand you know uh, to what extent would uh, uh, putin go and uh, so so your answer lies over there you know whether it is a conflict which has been engineered uh, by some forces in which some states become pawns you know like afghanistan becomes a pawn in the fight between the east and the west here you've got ukraine which is becoming a pawn in this fight and the sad part is that uh, these wars will not lead anywhere it is you know eventually it is innocent citizens or people like you and us who uh, suffer in this uh, conflict so uh, maybe some lessons would emerge whether what will happen what uh, you know course history will take Uh, you we found that the uh, global uh, you know institutions like the united nations and all have uh, not been able to uh, do much or to implement the other issue which i feel which a major lesson would come out of this is the nuclear issue you know the nuclear word has been used uh, by putin he did saber rattling so uh, and uh, ukraine as you know gave it up uh, voluntarily you know uh, a couple of years ago so whether this is sending a wrong message to the world that you should not give up your right to you know have nuclear weapons and iran is another case in point israel we are also uh, there in, on the same page so it may send some wrong signals uh, uh, down the line and the efficacy of nato also comes into uh, uh, question uh, at this stage so you see an increase in defense spending uh, germany china uh, you know Uh, where will all this lead who's benefiting these these are the questions that uh, we need answers to right sir and so this war has it uh, you know created a track of lessons for the indian air force uh, keeping in mind you know what do they need to you know we we all we also have very turbulent borders and very not yeah. so friendly neighbors and uh, you know you now you realize suddenly that uh, it can happen to you it can happen to others and uh, this could be just a right opportunity for anybody to you know uh, start start thinking that okay something's happening somewhere let's also start something yes i think uh, I, in, in my opinion if you ask me that there are uh, uh, major lessons for india uh, also because uh, a there is there is no substitute for hard power uh you, you know uh, you can have as much of soft power as you have india has that americans have a lot of soft power but uh, unless you have hard power uh, you you cannot win a conflict b you have to be dependent on your own self 
whether it is militarily, whether it is defense production, manufacturing, whatever treaties or alignments you may have, when it comes to the crunch, uh, you will see that what is happening in Ukraine's case, that nobody will come to your rescue. Making statements, saber rattling from uh, outside is not going to, uh, you know, uh, get you anywhere. Uh, see, uh, the, the third thing is, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we have to look at these new tools of war fighting where you can change the perception of the people or get into the cyber or the AI or these domains to be able to uh, neutralize an adversary without actually causing physical destruction. Or, you know, uh, like, I mean, Chanakya said that you, without, you fire an arrow and you, you kill the child in the womb, you know, before, I mean, uh, words to that effect. So, uh, uh, like I said, uh, you know, peace, when you talk of peace, it is not uh, the uh, uh, absence of conflict. Conflict will always be in there, will always be there, like it is there in families, so will it be there between nations. So, how do you manage this conflict is what is important. And this is where I think uh, there is a difference between uh, leaders and there's a diff and statesmen. So what I find we are lacking today are statesmen. The leaders are very strong. Putin is a very strong leader. Zelensky is a very strong leader. But where is statesmanship in this leadership is, is what I would like. Right, sir. Absolutely. Very true, sir. And uh, before we wrap up, sir, uh, there's one last question which I'd really like to ask. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, and uh, it, it, it's a geopolitical uh, repercussion question. And uh, is it so that, uh, you know, India has abstained from the voting? We have a very good friend, an old friend on one side and a new emerging friendship on the other side. So uh, how is it going to affect both the relations? Uh, you have people both for and against this. There are many people who would egg India to switch tracks and change sides and, you know, go the way of the West and uh, not get into, uh, uh, you know, any direct confrontation uh, with the Americans. And uh, uh, we've always taken pride in our strategic autonomy, to so to speak of. Uh, that is the right stand, I would say, uh, ethically, morally. But at the same time, you have to be self-sufficient. Uh, you know, like I said, Atma Nirvata or whatever that uh, the buzzword that we are talking of. So this is this is one part. The second part is that both these blocks, whether you talk of the Western bloc or the you know the Russian bloc, I think they cannot do without us. Uh, because uh, a country like India, which is a big emerging market economy, is uh, eventually going to find a place for itself on the high table. So even if we maintain our strategic autonomy, I don't think we have much to lose. Uh, only thing is we have to quietly, you know, like the Chinese would say, uh, bide your time and, you know, build your strength. And that is what we need to uh, be doing. But there's nothing wrong. I think what we are doing is absolutely right. Thank you so much, sir. It was wonderful to have spoken with you. I'm sure the audience would have got a lot of points in their mind, which they had for this air war and, uh, you know, for the larger perception of a geopolitical crisis. And uh, we'll be very happy to listen to what you have to say. And so now I take you back to Cyprus, to our studios there. Chitali is waiting for us. And yeah. thank you so much. We really hope you come back again and we discuss the, you know, we are just hoping that we just this comes to an end and we can discuss the closure of the war again with you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Sangeeta. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. A very intriguing conversation, of course. And uh, definitely our audience will be in a better position to understand what's happening now with the warfare, uh, with this Russian-Ukraine war. Thanks for your time, sir. Hope to have another discussion with you once, as ma'am said, when the war ends. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chadari. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.